and then specialising in infrastructure. This covers areas such as water, rail, bridges, tunnels, aviation, nuclear and defence. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about my career, but first of all, introducing Sam. I am an assistant cost manager with the infrastructure business, similar to Claudia, and at the moment my specialism is in rail, so I'm working on King's Cross Remodelling. It's an exciting project in the centre of London, and I'll tell you more about later. And Ursula, if you want to give an introduction to yourself and Turner and Townsend. Hi, I'm Ursula. By the way, I'll be looking at a separate screen, so apologies for not looking at the camera. Um, I'm sharing the slides. So I'm Ursula, I'm a junior consultant, and I sit within the sustainability team, so work on a range of projects across real estate and infrastructure, but mostly focusing on net zero carbon, which um, I'm sure you've heard of. It's, it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. First of all, I'm just going to introduce TNT and like what who we are as a business. So basically, um, before we get into the careers journey, the current work and advice, we'll just do a little intro. So we um, run a range of services, from project management, cost commercial management, program management and advisory. So Within our advisory services, we offer uh, uh, con contract services, health and safety, consulting, which includes sustainability and health and safety. Um, and then I'll just go through about where we operate. So we run across about 111 offices in 45 different countries. So we've um, a bit of a growing company. When we joined in 2019, there's about 6,000 employees, and now we've gone up about um, 800 since then. So. Um, I won't go into too much detail. Where we operate, so mostly in the UK, so about 3,000 of our employees, um, a range from real estate, infrastructure and natural resources, uh, then followed by America, where they mostly operate in infrastructure, and then the rest of the world, like Europe, Middle East and Asia, are mostly in the real estate side of things. Um, just going into a bit more detail um, about real estate and infrastructure and natural resources, what type of projects we work on. So. Um, in terms of real estate, we have a health and education team. So this uh, covers schools, universities, hospitals. We also work on commercial development and commercial occupier type projects. Um, this can be like offices as well. Uh, also residential schemes and different types of stadiums for events such as uh, Wimbledon tennis, Commonwealth Games, uh, etc. So um, infrastructure, I think Claudia already gave a brief introduction to this, but water, rail, aviation, roads, bridges, those types of thing. And then finally natural resources, um, which we don't really have much experience in as graduates, but uh, a range of like oil and gas, mining and renewable energy sectors. So I think we're passing over to Claudia. Thanks, Ursula, for that great introduction. Yeah, so I'm now going to talk to you about my career in project management, kind of the steps I've taken to get there and then what kind of lessons I'd learned along the way that no matter what career you go into, you can definitely apply to your own career path. So if you go on to the next slide, Ursula. So I started off in secondary school. I then decided to go on to university and take an integrated master's, which is doing your bachelor's and your master's at the same time. And I did this in civil engineering. Then instead of going straight into project management, I took what I call my gap year where I went off on a completely different career path for a year, looking at finances and services, so running bars and shops, um, before coming in to being an assistant project manager at Turner and Townsend. So starting off with university, if you click on the next slide. Why did I go to university? Well, I was considering apprenticeship, and it is definitely a strong career path to think about. Not every career needs a degree, and sometimes I think it's more beneficial if you go straight into the workplace with an apprenticeship. You learn hands on skills and you learn on the job. Not everything you need to be learning off a textbook and then going into the real world with a job and applying that straight on. Quite a lot of things I learned at university, I'd never used them in my real life job in terms of the things I'd learned by books, but it's all those transferable skills I'd learned at university. And it was that little bit of extra time to mature. So I knew, although an apprenticeship was a great opportunity, and there's some really great kind of scholarship programs for getting on apprenticeships as well. I knew I wasn't really ready for the real world or that responsibility. I was still really keen on learning. I love school and I wasn't ready for that real life job. So I chose to go to university 
And the reason I chose to study civil engineering was I was just fascinated by the way things were built. I actually picked that career path quite late on because I went to an all girls school and I didn't have the opportunity to hear about engineering. Um, when I finally discovered it and told my careers department I want to do it, they say, that's great, we can't support you. But there's a boys school down the road. If you want to walk over one lunch, we'll give you permission to leave. So it was quite difficult to get into the engineering career path, but Google is great. You can find out so much by Google. And also I found one parent's dad and um, one, one of my friend's dads that did engineering. So I ended up asking him about it and getting into it that way. So I was a bit more prepared of what I was signing up to. So at university, I went to Imperial College London um, stayed quite close to home, but I decided to move out to give myself that bit of independence and start building up those life skills that I'd eventually need for the real world. On my four year course, I tried a lot of different things as clubs and societies, making sure to kind of push myself out of my comfort zone. Um, university is a great bubble to really learn and develop yourself, discover new things. <clears throat> Um, that was really, really great and probably some of my highlights at university. And it's a great way to make your close bunch of friends too. Over my summers, I decided to do internships. Um, not everyone does internships, but I did quite a few, mostly because I needed a summer job and it's actually a great way to make money. And at the same time, I had no idea what career path I wanted to do after university. So each summer I tried a different type of civil engineering to see what's it like, is it something I want to do? And these range from four weeks to three months as a job. So I gave a try to structural engineering, um, sustainable drainage, highway assessment, bridge engineering. And what I found was I liked all of them. I could easily do them as careers, but they still weren't something I loved. It was actually a project at university that made me discover project management. So if you click on the next slide, Ashla. One of my highlights at university was something called construction area, which is where we went to a big site and we were given blueprints for a miniature oil rig and just told as a team of 20 to build it. Um, I took the project management lead role on this and I coordinated the schedule of all the workers when we had all our concrete deliveries, all the materials, who's going to work on what part, which bit needs to be built first. And then we together as a team of 20 built this oil rig float flooded out the dry dock and actually floated it into place in the river, which was really, really cool. And that's how I discovered project management is actually a career. So here are some other pictures of just my time at university, taking part in sports teams, internships, going to see a coffer dam being built, which is the little yellow crane building this kind of blockade in the river. And then when we designed our own steel beams up top. My advice from university is definitely weigh up degree versus apprenticeship. There's no reason to put yourself into student debt if you want to do something a bit more hands on technical, learn on the job and apprenticeships a great way to go. And then you'll find when people come out of university three, four years later, you've already got three, four year head start on them in your particular area. Um, if you go to university, make the most of it, try new things, um, push yourself out your boundaries you really might find you discover something that you didn't know you liked. Um, I was actually quite terrified of public speaking, if you could believe that. And now I actually find I really love these kind of things. And gain some experience, no matter what the experience, you have some transferable skills. So it doesn't have to be an internship. It could be working in a bar, working in a supermarket, babysitting, coaching sport. All of those teach transferable skills such as responsibility, organisation, communication skills and they're the most important things to have. So I'll tell you about my gap year now. My gap year was me getting elected into our student union. I was deputy president and a charity trustee for a year so this meant I was in charge of a 10 million pound budget which is quite a ridiculous thing to be in charge of when you're 22. Um, I also was in charge of five bars which brought in all our revenue and two shops. So we had 18,000 members that we had to look after. And one key point of this role was communication. If you didn't communicate what you were spending your money on, why you're making decisions, how to settle disagreements, 
things coming up in the news. If you weren't communicating with the membership, you had 18,000 people really angry at you. So that was one of my key lessons I learned from this role. Although nothing to do with infrastructure project management, I was learning how to manage stakeholders, understanding how businesses worked, how to campaign, do finances, communicate. And actually, I did learn project management just in a different context. I was learning how to manage the different bars, the different shops, any kind of projects they were putting on if they wanted to redevelop something or if they wanted to start a new event. This was all small project management. So it was a great transitional year for me. It meant I had real life responsibility, but I still had the university social life. And for me, I found that a really way to ease in from university to my actual job as a project manager. So if you move on to the next slide. As a project manager, I'm on the two year grad scheme at Turner and Townsend, which welcomes any degree background to give us a really diverse thinking cohort. It means that I'm constantly challenged from, I think, very logically in step by step processes because of my degree. But lots of people from their different degrees or different backgrounds from being apprentices have very different ways of thinking. And that's a great way to challenge you and grow you. We work on this 70 20 10 training module. So most of your experience is going to be hands on learning on the job. 20% of it is going to be kind of talking to different people, taking up skills, and 10% is going to be proper training where you go on courses such as we get put on the Association of Project Managers, Project Management Qualification, that just kind of teaches you the book templates of how to be a great project manager. What I love about Turner and Townsend is every six months to maybe three years, you rotate projects. So I've been really lucky to work with multiple clients so far, having done a year with Shell on digitalization and health and safety, and work with Welsh Water on a business case for a sewage treatment plant. And currently my main person is the Crown Estate where I'm working with the M1 to upgrade the Junction 8. And I'll tell you about this in a second. My main tip though, is wherever you go to work, whenever you do an internship, whatever situation you're in, take an opportunity to upskill yourself. You'll never know what skills you need in the future. And the more experience you can bring to a role, the more attractive you are to that company to get a job. So moving on. Just tell you quickly about my project. My current project is the multi-million pound package of design works for the Crown Estate. We are upgrading the Junction 8 of M1 because the Crown Estate want to build real estate around the area. But first, to get their planning permission, they have agreement they're going to upgrade the infrastructure first. So that's part of the project I'm working on. Mostly home based in the office or just in my room. As you can see, we haven't got a super formal dress code. Quite a lot of us are quite relaxed on the call and it's dressed for the occasion you need. So if you're seeing a very formal client, if you're going into their office, then you dress a bit more formally, but otherwise it's pretty chilled. Um, I occasionally visit site going up in full PPE, but most of my day to day experience is being on Zoom calls or Teams calls, as you can see up in the corner, um, having that day to day interaction with all the different suppliers. I also take charge of handling all the monthly performance reporting, the budget, the invoices, the program schedule, and then the deliverables. But the most important thing is that my job is there to make sure that we're delivering our deliverables on cost and on schedule so that the client doesn't have any extra costs or nothing goes late. And that's a really key point of communicating with everyone to bring that team together to deliver that project. So finally, my advice to other people, if you go on the next slide, Ashla. Um, What I've learned over the years is don't rush, enjoy the journey and follow your passions. You don't have to get it right the first time. You don't have to go straight into that career. It's okay to take a break. You're going to be working for 50 years. So what is it if you delay your career a year or two? It's nothing overall. Um, another bit of advice is network. Careers fairs are great. Um, they're open to all different ages. Um, universities, when, if you go, have specific ones, but your schools might have one or there might be public ones as well. You can also get involved by going, get involved by going to online lectures or visiting professional 
um, institutes or talking to staff, they're a great way you can find out by Googling. And then another good piece of advice I've been given is any experience is good experience. As I was saying before, internships or work shadowing is great, but having that volunteering, the sports coaching, the shop assistant job, all teach transferable skills. And as long as you have a CV that you can kind of express those and highlight, you have learned something from this experience and you could apply that to the next job you want. They will love that. And don't worry about getting it right the first time. There's multiple careers and multiple ways to get in them. All three of us have rather similar careers now, but came from very different backgrounds, got there to very different ways, and that's okay. And um, that is what gives you the diversity in a company. And that's what's really loved by companies. That's what they're looking for. And finally, I'll leave you with my last bit of advice that I was given. Find a job that you love so it doesn't feel like work or find a job that has hours that allows you to do as many of the things you love as possible. So I'll pass you over to Sam now to talk about commercial management. Thanks for that, Claudia. That's some great advice at the end there. Um, just a really quick one. Um, we're going to do a Q&A at the end, but if anyone has any questions throughout, please feel free to put them in the chat and then we'll uh, get to them at the end as well. Um, so just about my career path, it's um, very similar in the sense that I went to university as well. I studied uh, business, biology and geography at um, sixth form. I didn't do very well in my sixth form. I considered it a bit of a failure and kind of used that as a... Um, a motivator for kind of push myself out of my comfort zone at university and similar to Claudia I uh, tried to do as many things as I could so like, I had a few part I had three part-time jobs while at university ran a few sports teams and like tried to volunteer as much as possible and part of that included doing volunteering over the summers so between my first and second year I worked with the ICS team, so that's International Citizenship Service, and helped young people in Tanzania start businesses. And then between my second and third year, I did an internship in China to as part of like a procurement team there. So it's just trying as many different things as possible is always like best way to get yourself out of your comfort zone and just try and see what you're after in life and see what kind of motivates you and you enjoy. And then before joining Turner and Townsend, I was a finance assistant at my university for six months before being promoted to a senior finance assistant within the team for another year. I then got the job offer to work at Turner and Townsend in September 2019. So I took a few months to kind of try something different, something a bit more corporate before I joined Turner and Townsend as a credit risk analyst. So I worked with Gazprom Energy, who are an energy supplier in the northwest and worked on their credit risk team for it was a, an eye-opening experience and it really prepared me for um kind of more a corporate environment with Turner and Townsend so if you want to go on to the next slide Esla so similar to Claudia's part about uh, gap year this is more about um volunteering which I found is something that's really helped my career so I started volunteering when I was 17 in a nature reserve near myself. It was just a great opportunity to work with others, work as part of a team, while also kind of getting outdoors and, you know, knowing that you're helping out the environment. I then, while in my first year at university, start, worked with the Uprising Leadership Programme. So that was more of a long term project that was over nine months. And I worked with them to create a social action campaign where we worked on the community between the university students in Salford and the local residents there. And kind of, there was a bit of tension between the two groups. So it's kind of working on kind of bridging that gap there and building a greater community between the two. And then I went, as I mentioned before, I went to Tanzania with Raleigh International and worked on helping young people start businesses and then joined the youth police the youth commission for police and crime in cheshire and that was much more of a like a kind of a leadership role where i was able to um work with the young people across cheshire to kind of to get the views of thousands of uh students and young people across cheshire and then present them to the police commissioner as along with various other stakeholders from the police and crime space and that was quite a good opportunity to kind of analyse the findings that we got and put forward recommendations to the police commissioner. So that was a, a big opportunity there. I then, from that opportunity, got to work with uh, Manchester City Youth Council. 
So I, with them, I was a volunteer youth worker. And that was a great opportunity to work with the young people that ran the youth council. So some of those were um, youth members of parliament there. And it was great to hear their ideas and help them kind of push their social action campaigns forward. So it's kind of coming a bit full circle for myself there, having ran my own social action campaign when I was younger to then helping others. And the opportunity with the Manchester City Council was great and it helped me get involved with some wider EU based projects. So I was able to travel to Portugal and Romania to develop a, a larger platform with some other EU partner countries. So that was a great opportunity. And beyond that, the benefits I've had are you get to develop new skills and you'll get to work in environments that you never thought would interest you. And you'll get to, just because it's volunteering doesn't mean it's not going to be business related. So the idea when I was working in Portugal or Romania, it really helped me with the idea of putting business cases together and having to present my ideas. And it's also a great way to get leadership skills. So it may you may just start out with like volunteering in nature reserve, but then you can kind of leverage your experience to get um, more leadership opportunities as you kind of progress your own skills. It's a great and it, as it says, it's a great way to meet new people. I've got friends from all over the world now that I'm still in touch with, and it's great to keep um, those kind of connections. And obviously it helps uh, with a cause that's close to you. With volunteering, you can choose whatever you want to get involved with. I've been involved with a variety of things, but um, I've always tried to volunteer close to where I'm living at the time. Uh, obviously not the Tanzania one, but that was a, more of a different uh, experience. <laughs> and then it gives you the opportunity to try something new and put something on your CV as well. As, so you're helping others while also kind of developing yourself. So if you want to go on to the next slide, let's look. This is a bit more about my role at Turner and Townsend and commercial management at Turner and Townsend. I'm also on the uh, two-year graduate scheme as well as Claudia and Ursula. And my first line here is about um, what traditional quantity surveying was versus what it is now. Traditional quantity surveying, you might have to go out on site and count every nail and screw that's been put down on the project or something like that. But now it's more electronic based. There is definitely still that element of site work. As you can see from these pictures, you're definitely still needed on the ground, but a lot of it is more technologically based and each project is different with its requirements. And um, yeah, it's always definitely good to get some time on site with regardless of whether it's needed or not. It's just as long as you can, it really gives you a fresh perspective going out on site. I'm sure um, Claudia will agree with her brilliant site pictures earlier. And I think with the Oh, Sam, you gone on mute. That was part of the plan. Um, <laughs> Go back 30 seconds. So I don't know where I left there, but um, always good to get time on site. I mentioned that. And I think um, part of Turner and Townsend, the great aspect there is uh, the variety of clients that are available to us and the variety of contracts from a commercial perspective. So um, for us, there's a as uh, Claudia mentioned, there's a variety of sectors within infrastructure and then a variety of sectors in real estate. And from a commercial perspective, there's a variety of contracts that we can work on. So a lot of clients are on the NEC contracts, but then myself working in Network Rail, they use their own bespoke contracts that are based off a variety of different contracts. So it really kind of pushes your professional range of skills to uh, develop yourself further. And as part of the 10% of uh, learning that uh, Claudia mentioned. I'm doing the uh, an RICS accredited master's degree that TNT are funding, and that's helping me work towards my um, RICS membership status. So, if you want to go on to the next slide, Ursula. My current project is with Network Rail. I'm working on King's Cross remodeling. So, that's the fantastic project in the centre of London where we are kind of revamping all of the infrastructure from the station that hasn't been changed since the 1970s. So there's um, three tunnels in King's Cross and currently one of them has been out of use for 40 years, probably 50 years. And now we're bringing that back kind of to use and now it's going to increase the capacity of the station massively. And as the project is in a live environment, the station is still being used a lot of the building and construction work is taking place through possessions and nighttime working so recently the project has completed a 101 day possession of the station where we had closed half the station and then as while we did work on that half of the station we then reopened 
and clo close the other half of the station. And that kind of allowed the work that we'd done to be tested while as we had done it and kind of show that we're doing great work while we continue to uh, complete the projects. So that was a, a great opportunity to work with a great client and with a variety of stakeholders. As it's in uh, central London, it's not just um, like it's not just the project we have to worry about and our contractors. It's also the local residents and the other companies around the station and the area. So um, in one of my further pictures, you'll be able to see that um, Google is a massive stakeholder for us. They're building their flagship land scraper, they're calling it. It's the size of a skyscraper put on its, uh, on its side there. And that's right next to the track. So we're often having to deal with them and kind of work with them to uh, get our possessions and get our work completed. So uh, a large part of uh, what I do is commercial reporting for the client. Network Rail works on a four weekly commercial reporting period cycle. And I manage a lot of the contractors change requests when they try and claim more money from the clients. And I work, I'm currently working on the final account of the project as the large, as the majority of the works are now completed. I've now got 72 million pounds to look through and make sure everything's set for the client and they can be happy to sign off that payment. And I constantly work on applications for payment as well. Every month, the contractor needs more money to continue doing work. So I work on reviewing them on a monthly basis. So if you want to go on to the next slide. So this is just um, some brief thoughts on what I've learned during my time in the industry is um, never be afraid to like, ask questions. So um, one advice that I always get given is, um, yeah, no question is a stupid question. Just if you don't know it, it's better to that you find out because then you can help the team around you and you're all working on the same page and of course uh, don't be afraid to kind of give your opinion in meetings early on i would always try and ask questions in meetings and i'd often get that that it's, um a lot of young people don't speak up in meetings and it's quite good to have your opinion heard you have a valuable perspective all of you every one of you so it's um it's always good to speak up in meetings and make sure that your opinion your voice is heard uh, an important one in rail and in construction is um, kind of staying connected with everyone, not necessarily everyone, but trying to stay connected with as many people as possible, like your classmates and your colleagues at work. They'll be fantastic connections for later on in life. I found that like a lot of people I connect with LinkedIn or people that I've worked with have been like a massive inspiration for myself and they've gone on to do great things that I've then thought of looking into myself. So it's a great way to keep yourself inspired and keep yourself motivated throughout your career. And of course, don't burn bridges, which sounds like a simple one, but um, a lot of people uh, uh, cross paths again later in their career. So especially in rail, with it being quite a small sector, um, a lot of people will work together in later in later down their career. So it's obviously a course to remain amicable with everyone and uh, not burn any bridges there. And um, finally, a good part of uh, interview prep with um, so I came from a business studies background with my degree. So um, one of the things that all employers ask for is commercial awareness. And going into the interviews, I'd never really had any interview prep and advice. And I wasn't really sure what that meant, even though, which I felt ridiculous as a business student. I feel like I should know what that means. But um, I think always some advice that I got was um, just kind of stay up to date on your employer, that your prospective employer that you're interviewing with, kind of understand what they're doing in their industry and understand what the industry trends are. And that'll kind of help you with your interview and just help you know that it's an organization and an sector that you want to work in as well. So I think, Ursula, I think that might be the last slide. Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah. That's really good advice there. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to take you through um, just my background, my career background, where I came from, then a little bit about sustainability and what I do at TNT, and then um, some development skills that I've learned and that you potentially learn as well, just from getting work experience. And then finally, hope to, uh, hopefully I can give you some good advice um, from my lessons learned over the years. So I'll start before this step one. So I did three A-levels, uh, um, six forms. So I did geography, chemistry and music. So whilst they sound a little bit unrelated, I think my kind of the way I went about it was I'm going to pick three subjects that I really like. And then eventually, you know, out of those three subjects, I'll decide where do I want to go um, with my career from there. So I decided out of those three, geography was the one for me and I went to university. And whilst I was at university, um, I signed up to this mentoring scheme because it was promoted there. I know a lot of universities do do this or colleges. If you um, say, if you don't go to university, uh, 
there is always ment- I think it's mentoring schemes online as well. Different industries and businesses offer, also offer mentoring schemes within their businesses for um, interns or just students in general. So I was fortunate enough to be paired up with um, a project manager from Arup, which is a global engineering firm. So this was a really good insight for me. She invited me to that office in London. So I got to walk around, um, meet some people. That was a really good experience for me just to see what the office environment's like, because uh, often people don't get to walk around an office before they you know, step in for their interview. It's just also to see that is this the environment that I want to work in? Um, some people might go, this isn't for me. So it's it's just good to get that kind of experience um, grow those connections. She also helped review my CV and various things like that. So that was, um, I would yeah, really recommend that if you get the opportunity. Um, and then applying for summer placements. This is something that um, I, I, because I knew when I left university, I wanted to go straight into work. So um, I know not a lot of people do, but that was kind of my thinking. And I knew that if I, you know, grad schemes are very high, are highly competitive with the application processes now. I knew I needed to get some form of work experience and industry experience. So this was something that um, I was really looking for. Um, however, before I got into the built environment, I thought I was going to go into flood management, just following the kind of courses on my um, d- degree. So I thought I'll apply to loads of flood management schemes. Um, turns out they actually want someone very specific with a specific degree about hydrology so or a master's. So it was um, definitely something I learned there was look into the kind of qualifications for the pathway that you really want to go down and see if you're properly qualified. But also, again, it's also about networking as well. So that was something I learned as well. I um, attended various networking events. So I saw um, an advert for Thames Water. They did, they were doing their first ever innovation event and it was like a, a challenge. So, you, the, you know, loads of young people, students went along and they had different professional services there. And they did gave you some insight, great presentations. And then also you were put into teams, given a task. And then at the end of the, the day, they, you know, you presented to the panel, including people who work at Thames Water and these other professional services. So it's a great opportunity to get yourself known and stand out. And at the end, I think they gave the winning team an internship. So that was a really good way to kind of put yourself, get that opportunity. Um, my team didn't get the internship, but we were prize winners. So at least that's something I can put on my CV, you know, I won a prize at, you know, this networking event. And also you can meet other people, even if you don't, you know, win or get anything out of it, there's, you will always learn something. So being put into a team of strangers uh, is something that's, you know, really challenging for some people. So helps with your communication skills, um, helps you to deal with someone who might be a bit quieter, trying to help, you know, get them out of their shell, you know, contribute to the team could be you know dealing with someone who's maybe a little bit louder and hard to um you know change their mind about something working in a team is a you know something that's really um really looked upon as attractive for um, many organizations so it's it gives you that kind of experience um even if you don't have any work experience going to those events and learning how to mix with other people that gives you something to say in your interview if you say don't manage to get any other experience um so also another thing with networking is among your friends and family, if you know there's a career you want to go to, or if you don't, even then, just talk about it with different people, learn about what other people do, speak with them, go, oh, I didn't consider that, or, you know, get to know someone, and they might have a friend of a friend who's in the business and might be able to get you some work experience. That's how I managed to eventually get some experience, even though it wasn't in what I thought I wanted to go into. Um, I was offered a six-week internship or summer placement with um burn group who are they do like construction um they're a subcontractor so they do all the kind of form work concreting uh demolition excavation type works and um i, I went into that thinking oh god i don't know anything about this i'm not going to be very good like i don't even ever want to do this because i don't think yeah i just didn't think it was for me i didn't know anything about it and then at the end you know within a week or so i was like wow this is really exciting get to go to site get to see all these things get to actually have an impact and I just learned so much on the job so I I, that's when I realized you know what I'm going to apply to grad schemes in the built environment for environmental management sustainability and that just shows you that you know if take any opportunity that comes to you even if you think that you know that doesn't sound like it's for me or you don't you don't particularly know anything about it that's definitely something I would recommend just do it and especially if you've got no other opportunities around so um, you never know you might end up liking it and making a career out of it so 
Um, so yeah, then finally I applied to grad schemes in my final year at university and I ended up at Tanner and Townsend. Again, that was for a network. Um, some of my friend at university uh, did a placement year at Turner and Townsend. She did a, a quantity surveying degree. And I said, she said, why don't you apply? And I said, well, you don't have uh, like environmental management sustainability on your grad scheme, like on the application. And it turns out she spoke to someone internally at TNT and they said, well, actually we're looking to build that. So through that, I just applied to the grad scheme. That network got me in that. So I've always, I wouldn't have applied if I hadn't have had that network. So I thought, oh, then, you know, they're not advertising for it. So sometimes companies don't always advertise for certain roles, but they are, they've got plans in the background to, to build and bring more people in. So definitely, yeah, again, use our network. That's kind of the main moral of the story for me. Um, and then just talk about sustainability. I'm sure you probably already know what this is, but it's just important to recognise that it's not always about the environment and that um, now so social sustainability is a really big thing, looking at health and wellbeing, but also supporting like building for communities um, as well. But mostly the kind of reason that, you know, any most people going into sustainability nowadays is because in the built environment, we are the biggest carbon emitters, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, uh, we have the UK has legislated to reach net zero carbon by 2050. So what this means is that we can still emit carbon, but we need to make sure that we balance it out, whether through offsetting or starting to produce renewables, reducing our emissions in other ways. So as you can see here, that all the orange bit is all different parts of the built environment, whether it's buildings that already exist and it's their operational energy, or if it's the actual construction um, carbon emissions that are impacting the environment. So, and if and if you look compared to transport, we are the biggest emitters. So that's why it's really important and really key all uh, the organisations approaching us at the moment to reduce their um, carbon emissions. So in terms of services that we are offering, I won't go through all of them, but the kind of main thing that we get at the moment is uh, organisations come to us and go, right, so you know, they've seen the UK legislation, they know they've got to do something about reducing their emissions and they've all committed to, well, most people now commit to net zero carbon and they come to us and go, okay, how do we actually get there now? What do we do? We've made the commitment, we've put a target out publicly. So what are we going to do? So we, you know, we work with them to identify and categorise, okay, where do your emissions come from? What are your direct emissions? Where are your indirect emissions? And let's calculate them form a baseline and then pathway to plan to net zero. How can we reduce these over time to gradually get to that to that net zero by whether it's 2030, a lot of organisations commit to, but the, the legal requirement is 2050. So they're just a range of things that we're doing at the moment. Um, and then to, there's just a few of the projects. So um, the top two are government funded. So these are our two major programmes um, at the moment. Um, so the one on the left is for workplaces. So this is looking at making um, different non-domestic uh, public sector properties energy efficient. So um, a lot of them are energy inefficient at the moment. So this could be schools, universities, hospitals, museums, any kind of public um, workplace type building. And at the moment, we've retrofitted over 800 um, across London, which has saved 38,000 tonnes of carbon per year, which is amazing. And um, similar with the Homes programme, it's also government funded. And it's looking to make these social housing, which is currently really energy inefficient, to make them warm and ultra low carbon. So the range of ways that we can do this is, you know, helping them uh, to install like solar PV insulation, um, different kind of uh, windows um, and then heat pumps as well. Uh, finally, two of the other projects more on a like consulting basis and more technical. Um, we're helping with the City Bank, so that's a major redevelopment. It's about 47 floors. It's based in Canary Wharf. It's a £1 billion um, redevelopment. So they're looking to make sure that they're sustainable um, and reach their uh, different environmental accreditations that they have to reach um, and different targets that they want to, to get. So we're just working with the design team to make sure the design team are factoring in all these sustainable factors and that they will actually reach the client's targets. And then finally, uh, MBNL, which is Mobile Broadband Network Limited. They're a merge of um, 3 and EE, so in the telecoms industry. They're working to install 5G across the UK. So working with them to make sure that they're um, you know, compliant with uh, environmental legislation, also identifying any risks or because a lot of the sites that they work on are rural. So make sure they don't interfere with the kind of nature and water streams, different things like that. So. Um, 
I think just finally to go over some different skills that you can learn or that I've learned as well. So attending all these events, like any opportunity you get, any type of job, you learn communication skills. Um, in some of them, if you go to networking events where you're asked to present, that's something, you know, put yourself out of your comfort zone. It's one of those things that the more practice you do, the better you get at it and hopefully like the less nervous you'll be. And then networking, again, I've said that quite a few times now, but I think that's really important. And then also leadership skills, that's something that is really um, uh, attractive to employers. And then commercial awareness, which Sam has already covered. And then technical skills, I've learned how to be a consultant now. I've learned how to engage with clients. I've learned how to identify risks and manage them. And then, um, like the others, performance reporting and data analysis. So I'm just going to give you a few top tips of mine. So if you get the opportunity to sign up to Mentoring Scream, I would definitely do that. Um, seek help from your career centre, whether it's at school, college, university or otherwise. Um, get someone to review your CV before you send it off. Always get at least maybe two people to check. Um, get someone to do mock interviews with you. Um, I wouldn't recommend walking to an interview unrehearsed. That's um, I think if you're up against someone who's had, you know, someone else prepare them and like sit them down and ask them questions, then they're obviously going to be a lot more well rehearsed. And sometimes you think that you know what you're going to say, but until you actually practice saying it out loud, um, it doesn't always go the way that you think it's going to go. So I definitely get, um, whether it's a teacher or a friend or a family member or a career advisor to sit down and practice with you, that's something I would really recommend. And then take every opportunity because you never know where it's going to lead. And then uh, last two, so keeping up to date with industry news. So if you're not on LinkedIn already, I don't know if it's a bit early, but try and um, yeah, get on LinkedIn, follow the kind of industries or companies that you're really interested in, keep up to date with the, you know, what they're doing in the market as well. And then lastly, set yourself a five year plan. So where would you like to be in five years time, whether that's at university or in a job or apprenticeship, whatever that is, work then work backwards. So what do I need to do to get there? Do I need any qualifications? Do I need to sign up to anything? Do I need to apply? Um, and then just work, yeah, work backwards from there and set what do I need to do to get there and to reach my goals? Um, yeah, so that's that's it from me. I think we're going to do a Q&A now, I think. So we'll open up the floor either Raise your hands, put it in the chat, um, or just shout out. Um, I think while people are typing their questions, I'm going to start off with a question um, just for the other two. Both of you um, ended up applying and getting a job for TNT, but are there any other places you apply for jobs? How many CVs did you have to send out? How did you find that kind of process of trying to get that job before you pick TNTs? Um, let's start with Sam. I love that we've all said ended up. It's like I ended up here. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's a great opportunity to work at TNT. Um, I applied at like a disgusting amount of places. I um, applied so many times. I um so I didn't get a grad job when I graduated and I applied for I don't know how many places during my final year and then I think about a month after I graduated I got the job that I, at my university and then I worked there for a while and then I think I'd got promoted and I just realized this, this wasn't developing me it wasn't challenging me anymore so I think um I'd seen TNT at a careers fair and didn't really understand what they were. Didn't know, didn't hadn't heard of TNT before, and just thought oh, I don't want to be a builder as a grad job. But that's not what TNT does in any way. It's like really complex and really technical work. And it was um, so was like literally, I saw them at a grad fair and just applied that day. And um, yeah, I honestly I can't like count the amount of time, amount of job applications I've probably done, and the amount of like versions of my CV I've done for different companies. But um, yeah, it's definitely a long haul getting to TNT. But um, yeah, really happy now I'm here. Sorry, Esla, go on. Yeah, so for me, um, again, I applied to yeah, a number, quite a few different grad schemes. I think because grad schemes are very competitive they're very hard to get onto and like I said having that work experience having some kind of relevant experience really does help but if you don't you've just got to really find the way to to kind of beef up the other work you've done so you know especially in interviews may ask you questions where 
in, in your head you're thinking they want some really technical like a uh, relevant response but sometimes they just uh you know they they ask you questions like um you know name time we had a difficult situation it could be whether you're working at a bar or a retail store or anything like that but yeah for me I, I did apply to quite a lot of places and um yeah did get knocked back sometimes they don't even reply to your applications as well so if they're really big companies so there's always that waiting game of like are they going to apply some some schemes uh take a few months as well to even get back to you and there's i know at tnt there's multiple stages um so i mean it, some of the schemes i applied to had like online tests like verbal and like different shapes and at the point you're like this is a it's sometimes it's an exercise because so many people apply they just need to cut people out and i think sometimes that's just unfortunate it is um i like, guess sometimes it is, it is luck i guess but um that's all i can say yeah yeah i think um applying to a lot of companies it can be dis disheartening keep getting knocked back but there are some of those filters and um ai softwares they use to filter you out one thing i've learned as a lesson is um if a company has criteria on its website make sure you put those keywords into a cv because they have software that picks out those certain words so it makes it so much easier for them if you are literally just stating those keywords throughout your cv gives you a lot better chance of getting through um to the next round and it just makes it very easy for anyone who reads your cv to be like oh they've got that skill they got that skill that skill they hit all the targets through they go um i think that's quite a thing but also just keep being determined don't give up um but also ta tailor your cv for each company don't just blanket send them out because you want to mention some sort of thing that relates to the job you're applying um whether in a cover letter or cv i think a good point on that cover letter um so a good point on your criteria that you made there that is how i used to write my like cover letters not saying that's why I didn't get the jobs, but uh, no, I, uh, that's how I used to do is like kind of say there's like six bullet points for that criteria, kind of make each um, paragraph kind of relate to that criteria specifically, and then kind of really draw on any experience that you've got um, to kind of like f say how you deal with that and how you have dealt with that in the past. Yeah. I think also yeah. not everyone is very good at getting through those big company applications. Personally, when I've done internships, I have never been successful through a big company application, but the way I got in is networking. Um, one was through talking to someone's friend who had a dad who knew someone and ended up talking to them, building a network, and then asking, oh, do you have any shadowing I can do for a couple of weeks and go into a company that way? Um, another one, I went to a careers fair and butted in on a employees conversation about who lived closest to the office and I happen to live closer um, and then kind of sent them an email afterwards saying was really interested in your company was read on your website this and this I would really love if you have an internship um, opportunity they actually weren't offering internships but they were really impressed with how enthusiastic and keen I was and I'd taken the extra time to write a really personalized email so I was actually this company they only had 10 employees but I was their very first intern so you can get in that way um, and again that's just getting experience so don't be disheartened if big company applications don't work there are different routes in um, but network really is important there has anyone in the audience got any other questions or Anthony yourself okay we got one for from AJ about how many companies did we apply to before joining TNT um, mm. and have we got any rejections by any jobs I think never got rejected nope <laughs> gone off for every job <laughs> <laughs> I think we kind of covered that slightly about applying for jobs there um, but I guess dealing with the rejection do you want to just say a sentence about that each of us if we have been rejected which we haven't <laughs> so uh, hypothetically if we had been rejected <laughs> no I think um just I don't know it depends what stage you are it's, sometimes it can be a numbers game where like if you just really want to change job it is just like I remember when I left the university job that I was in I had been there 18 months I was just like I've got this offer at TNT I just want to try something new so I literally I must have applied to 30 jobs just on Indeed or something in one night 
and it was just like yeah okay I got a few rejections but I've got a couple of offers and I found something that I enjoyed to, uh, so that was a good opportunity it's just kind of like trying to get feedback when you get a rejection is always important so just like understanding why you rejected and then you can then develop and be better next time and it always helps and uh, every opportunity is a learning opportunity yeah. yeah I think rejection can hurt but at the same time if it doesn't hurt slightly when you do get rejected from the job you're probably not wanting the job anyway so it's a good thing you got rejected um I found some of the rejection letters I've got kind of helped me clarify actually well, I wasn't fussed by that why am I applying for that kind of job maybe I don't want to go into geotechnics um, maybe I want to do this area instead because I was actually more disappointed about this one that I didn't realize um, also it is a learning experience so the jobs I applied for were very broad set I did one for design engineering one for project management and one for business consultancy and the business consultancy one the interviews were seriously hard and although I got rejected in the last stage I took that away as why well, I got to the last stage so that's really really impressive I learned all these skills and I withstood a lot harder questioning than I actually thought I could so you can still pick out things and as Sam says ask for feedback you improve each time if you ask for feedback yeah definitely I think if you um another key thing is like you said you you need to really make sure you you really want the job especially if you're at the interview stage that like I I was kind of pressured by someone to go into oh you should go into teaching like apply for this teach first scheme and I <laughs> and I was like oh, okay I'll, I'll do it but it, it wasn't it didn't come from me I just applied because I, I wasn't quite sure where I was going to go at that stage I went to an assessment centre and it was the interview and they asked me why do you want to do this and and I thought I'd given an answer and they're like what then they asked me like two or three more times and I realized in the interview I was like I really just don't like obviously I didn't say that but you know I, I sat there and thought no I, this isn't what I want to do because if you know it was different when I went for the TNT interview I knew that I wanted to do it and I found that the interview went really well and it was really positive and it was def definitely more like a conversation because it was definitely something I, I was interested in and I wanted to be there and I knew that that's, that was like I was really driven um so yeah I think if you're going to go for an interview, really make sure that that, that is definitely what you want to do and, sh and show it in the interview. Um, smile. That's often what people forget when they're in an interview and you're so nervous. It's uh, just, yeah, be, be happy and show that you want to be there. Mm -hmm. I think interviews as well, interviews and assessment days are a great, great way to understand, do you want that job? Um, when I applied to Turner and Townsend, I still didn't fully know what project management was. Um, went through all the smaller stages before getting to the assessment day and wasn't particularly fussed about the job because I still didn't understand it and the different tasks they get you to do during the assessment day are the similar kind of skills you might apply in your job or the different areas you'll work in and I did the assessment day and was like actually this is actually quite fun like this is the job for me definitely um, I wasn't sure about it but that changed my mind so I would still say go to the interview or assessment day if you're on the fence um, but do make sure you're slightly passionate about the job before you go apply. Um, any other questions from people? Uh, Georgina, do you want to turn your mic on and ask? Yeah, sorry, my, the chat function isn't working, so I had to unmute myself. Um, I just wanted to ask what the main differences are between each of your roles, because I know you're all in project management, but I know it's slightly tailored to different things. So what are the main differences between them, please? So we're a project management and cost management company, but um, I think I'm the only one that does pure project management in out of the three of us. So as a project manager, um, the best way I describe my job in layman's terms is if you're ever doing a school project or a university project, and you have lots of different team members, each with a very specific task. That person in the middle who's checking in on everyone, making sure they're doing their task, they understand it, they're keeping to the overall kind of big picture idea. Um, if something of their small task impacts someone else, have they talked to each other? Um, and then when doing the pro project, if you've also got to think about costs and stuff, that person who's got the big picture understanding a rough idea of what each person is doing but not the specific technical knowledge that's what project manager does you're basically the glue that keeps the whole thing together um 
and on a day-to-day -day basis that pretty much involves communication understanding kind of the tasks and bringing them together and then usually a bit of finance or kind of scheduling um sam and Ursula, do you want to talk about your role uh, yeah um mine's um mine's more technical so i'm more like a, an actual consultant i uh consult on net zero and sustainability i work with clients and do more technical data analysis calculations and then reporting to the client helping them improve their sustainability of, of their organization whether it's in terms of the actual build or if it's just an internal organization it can um sometimes it's not even construction related it's just to do with their their office operations so that's more about how they can be more um efficient with their energy or their waste or different things that um different environmental aspects so that's more my type of role for uh, cost managers, uh, I think uh, it's, it, it can seem very similar to project managers. I think um, project managers definitely lead projects and uh, cost managers just make sure project managers don't spend too much and are very much the uh, kind of like, um, I don't know how to describe it, just make sure everyone's spending within budget and stuff like that, which, which can sound incredibly boring, but it's actually quite fun and it's, you can really get to understand different varieties of uh, projects and different aspects of it but um it is just kind of monitoring cash flow and kind of in in a sense being like a legal and accounting side of the project so we handle a lot of contracts and a lot of contract change items and then also the cash flow forecasts and a lot of that so it's kind of like uh, a marriage between legal and finance kind of that i don't know if that's a if I'm just chatting rubbish there, Claudia, or not, or what your perspective? I think PMs and CMs have different perspectives on uh, each other's roles, but um, yeah, yeah. No, that's from my perspective, that's what it is. Yeah, I work quite closely with some cost managers. Um, I think one of the most useful things of their job is that they kind of estimate how much the projects are initially going to cost. You mm. don't know if it's going to cost £500 or £2 million until yeah. a cost manager comes in and goes, this is what it'll cost when what you want to do is that that's a, another a good for. another good part of the um yeah what Claudia pointed out that is look, the cost manager's role kind of varies depending on which stage of the project you're in so if it's the pre-contract phase you're all about kind of estimating and drafting up the contract itself whereas during delivery of the actual project you're there to manage cash flow and make sure the work is happening as the contractor says it's happening and make sure you're not kind of, the client's not being taken for a ride in a sense so uh yeah, yeah. it's a, a fluid role and it's quite good Right, I'm going to come in now because we've we've just got a minute over and um, we've got some other insight sessions which students might be signed up for. But thank you so much, Claudia, Sam and Ursula for your time today. It's really great to see us using the full hour and um, getting so many good questions and hearing from your stories. So I'm sure students would have taken away lots of really great career advice looking back from their kind of school age right through to where you are in your career now. So thank you so much for your time um and uh yeah have a good day everybody thank you thanks thanks everyone bye bye